Good morning and welcome to our live talk program. This is Lloyd Grubb here, your host on Revive Reform Radio, doing our live talk program covering Wisdom for Living on your Friday morning rise and shine. Wisdom for Living this morning here, we're covering, as we look at the topic, pleasant words are as a honeycomb. Pleasant words are as a honeycomb is our topic for this morning here. So again, welcome to our live talk program and hopefully at a blessed night rest. And you're ready to take on this day or today that the Lord has given you. And um, we'll just begin with a short prayer. Our Father, what in heaven, we thank thee again for your love. We thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your words, dear Lord, that thou give us to us. Pray, Lord, you may grant us, dear Lord, your richest blessings that we might learn, dear Lord, and live uh, lives of wisdom, dear Lord, and that we might enjoy the blessings and the fruits of our relationship with thee. Be with us as we study and talk and meditate together. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, again, our topic here for this morning is um, pleasant words are as a honeycomb. And this is found in Proverbs chapter 16, as we're still working our way through Proverbs chapter 16. So, Proverbs chapter 16, here, um, pleasant words as a honeycomb, um, is one verse that I'm just going to go ahead and focus on. But I'll read from where we left off, from Proverbs chapter 16, verse 20. And we'll start there by reading from Proverbs chapter 16, verse 20, and to that until we get to the main verse, and then we'll deal with it verse, um, we'll deal with a little bit verse by verse, but our primary focus is here in Proverbs chapter 16. And so let's read. It says here in Proverbs 16, verse 20, He that handleth a matter wisely shall find good, and whoso um, trusted in the Lord, happy is he. The wise in heart shall be called prudent, and the sweetness of the lips increase learning. Understanding is a wellspring of life unto him that at it, but the instruction of fools is folly. The heart of the wise teacheth his mouth, and added learning to his lips. Pleasant words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones sweet to the soul and health to the bones so this is what we'll look at here this morning here this idea of pleasant words because pleasant words are needed by all we all are in need of hearing some pleasant words often in life there's so much things that are said that are words that are not pleasant they're unpleasant words and sometimes there's reasons for these unpleasant words but whatever the reason whatever the cause um, it, 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 you know, for unpleasant words, it does not add value to us. It takes away value. It brings us down and it makes us sad. And so we want to be able to experience pleasant words and we want to be able to be the ones that speak pleasant words that uplift. Now, I know in life that there's things that happen that makes it difficult um, to say pleasant words because sometimes the words that are spoken to us are not pleasant. Um, sometimes the situations that we're dealing with are unpleasant situations. And it would um, seem to push us in a direction that we could utter things and say things that are unpleasant. But when it's all said and done, our main communication, what we do as a practice, what is our consistent mode of operation, our consistent talk, how we communicate on a consistent basis should be pleasant. It should be something that is like having honey. It's just sweet and it just make you feel good inside. And that should be our mode of operation. And so we want to make this be our mode. So this will be our focus here. Now I'm going to go back and look at a verse 20 through 23 before I go to my main point. Um, he that handleth a matter wisely shall find good. And whoso trusted in the Lord, happy is he. So it's important for us to handle a matter wisely wisely when we approach situations i've learned over the years to whisper a prayer and just to ask the lord's blessing on simple situations simple interactions um simple activities i've learned just to whisper a short prayer why do i do that because um i realize sometime in life how quickly some things can go downhill how fast you can be in a situation where things just not go good they don't go good Things just go bad. And so because of that, I've learned to um, be careful and to approach situation 
and think it through. Because I'm telling you, a lot of times in life, people say, I was surprised. Why I was surprised? Because the the, the financial situation, the social situation, um, the spiritual situation, whatever they're dealing with, um, came very um, in a very sneaky way. You didn't, you couldn't foresee how we're gonna go bad. So I've learned to, you know, be meditative and prayerful in my approach to many things. And you know, still some things you have to learn because sometimes you go down an experience that you've never been down before, and you don't know how it's gonna go. So you always just be careful. And, you know, sometimes things go bad and no matter how much careful you are, it's going to be a learning lesson. You're going to learn something here. And that's what it is. But either hand, let a matter wisely shall find good because that's what it is. You're trying to reap as much as you can out of life. You try to do your best to get uh, squeeze as much life as you can out of life. When I think about every day that you approach a day, I approach a day and problems like I've ever used cheesecloth. I don't know if you've ever used cheesecloth. But if you use cheesecloth and you have something good in that cloth, but you're going to separate, separate like the, the, the seeds out or something, and you're going to get that cloth, you're going to hold it very good so you don't want anything to spill, and you're going to squeeze it to get all the juice out. You just want to get the good, sweet juice out of it and separate the pulp and the seed. And so when you drink that drink, it's going to be pleasant. And that's how you want to approach your day. That's how you want to approach each situations in life. Each matter that comes up in life, you want to see if much good you can get. So you want to be very wise in your approach. Verse 21 says, The wise in heart shall be called prudent, and the sweetness of the lips increase learning. So the sweetness of the lips increase learning. You know, it's important to note that we actually affect ourselves and we basically send ourselves down a certain path. You see, the more we talk stuff that is painful and bitter, is the more we will affect ourselves and we will decrease our learning. But when we talk things that are positively uplifting and pleasant, oh, it's a blessing and we learn a very good way of doing things. Um, you know, if you want certain bad reaction in life, then you say certain things, you get bad reaction. You want positive reaction, you say certain things, you get a positive reaction. So again, it's simply you want to be wise, you want to be prudent in all that you do. Verse 22 says, Understanding is a wellspring of life unto him that ha hath it, but the instructions of fools is folly. So a person who have understanding, they can grasp the situation, they can take in uh, a problem, they can take in a situation, and they can assess it properly and give you good instruction. What has to understand in order for one to instruct? And that's a difficulty in any type of instruction because when you do an instruction, it's sometimes the main thing you're trying to do basically is grasp what's going on. I don't matter. You're at a job site and you're working and say you were doing construction. If you don't understand how the ground and the typography um, is working for you or against you, and you, you start to work, you know, it's going to be difficult because you don't understand, you don't have grasp at this situation well. Same thing when dealing with human problems, same thing when dealing with situations of life. You got to be able to have a good grasp. But notice here it says, but the instruction of fools is falling. So you go to a foolish person and you take instruction from that person, it will end up in a folly. It will end up in that disaster, ma'am. You don't go to certain people to instruct you because they're very foolish. That's the reality of life. The heart of the wise teacheth his mouth and added learning to his lips. So the heart of the wise, wise teacheth his mouth and added learning to his lips. If you if you if you notice here again, it's the it's the emotional state. You know, there's some people that basically will always be foolish because they have a, a way of doing things. They have a way of what makes them excited, what they go by, um, and it just makes them keep foolish. Um, I've noticed even in church, there's people who their primary learning in church is the altar call, you know, and if you can preach an altar call, that's what get them going. So they, they, they don't, they're not used to, like what I'm doing here, they're not used to somebody lecturing or teaching the Bible. They have to get pumped up, hyped. And that's the only value of education. And without... 
entertainment without basically memes like if you're you're familiar with what goes on on facebook and stuff like that they have no education going on they can't go through reams of material and knowledge and wisdom and they can't be taught they can't be reasoned with their life is just basically instructed by an emotional pipe type of way but the heart of the wise teaches his mouth literally because that's how life is now we're going to go straight into our main focus here proverbs 16 verse 24 this is the meat of the matter that I'm here for, for you, with you this morning. It says, Pleasant words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, and health to the bones. Pleasant words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the mouth, to the soul, and health to the bones. So, when you think about this, this is the, the crux of life. This is what we all love. Everybody likes or love pleasant words spoken to them. Not necessarily everybody likes to speak pleasant words. But everybody likes to receive pleasant words spoken to them. And so this in itself is an exercise that we have to um, engage in. We have to exercise speaking words that are uplifting, that are pleasant. Because we know what it is like when we hear words that are pleasant and uplifting. We know what it's like to hear words that is sweet to the soul. That goes deep inside of our being. It is not something that we just hear and move on. Also, it is held to the bones. The Bible is very clear on this, that um, the, 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 the way that we, we speak, the way that we think, the way that we are, if we are a merry soul, it is held to our bones, that our health can come simply from our attitude in life. And so you want to have an attitude that is pleasant. Now, I'm going to read a verse that we had just covered, but I think it's important in this topic here this morning. It's in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 26. Proverbs 15, verse 26 says, The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant words. So the words of the pure are pleasant words. So this gives a source. What's the source? If the person's mind is corrupt, the words are going to come out that are not going to be pleasant. If the person's mind is corrupt, the words are gonna not going to come out or are not going to be, be pleasant. So if you're dealing in a situation where you are, you speak words that often are very, you know, bitter, very abrasive, very much so that when you speak, people want to fight, uh, people get angry and people countenances change, you can see their face change. And the moment you open your mouth, people just look depressed. Or if you've ever experienced that, where the moment a person, certain people open their mouth and they speak, you feel depressed. You feel like this cloud just comes over your mind and you feel like, wow, man, it's like it's cloudy outside. When you look outside, you realize it's sunny and blue skies. Well, the problem with that is that the person now, either if they're doing it or they're receiving it, the, whoever is doing it has to deal with the source that the source of the problem is from the mind. The Bible says, so a man think in his heart, so is he. Our source is always our brain. And often we speak a percentage, a small percentage of what we think. And so if a person speaks all the time negative words, depressing words, they speak about suicide, they speak about, um, you know, all these false ideas, false in innuendo. They like to sit all day long and listen to people talk bad about other people. And that's what entertains them. Then I tell you, the problem is the words, but the deeper problem is the thoughts. The thoughts dwell too much on negativity. And the thoughts need to be purged. When the thoughts purge, then the words will be purged. So again, the thoughts of the art of the wicked are abomination to the Lord. So it's the actions are abominable. But the problem is not with the actions, it's with the thinking. You know, the Bible has the saying where people re repeat often is rend your heart and not your garment. In other words, when you see something terrible, you need to tear your, your heart. Your heart needs to be broken or torn in pieces and not your garment. And people always misquote and misunderstand what the text is saying. And the problem is that you need to feel it deep inside. And so here, the Lord is saying, the real problem with somebody that's abominable is not just the action. The actions are terrible, 
but it's the thinking. The thinking is wicked. So when the mouth opens and the mouth starts to speak, as I say, it's like somebody vomiting on you because they say words that just make you just feel dirty because the things they're saying is like, why are you saying that? You know, this is not necessary. So, but the words of the pure are pleasant. So if a person of pure thoughts and the thoughts are clean, then what normally happen will and will follow is that the words will speak. And when the words speak, it just make you feel good. <laughs> it just make you feel nice, you know, because the words are nice. You know, there's, there, that's just the reality. There's just some things that are just like, I've, I've, I've seen movies in the past, you know, when I used to watch movies and I used to listen to certain crazy music and be entertained by it. Often I never really thought then, what is it and who is it that write this thing? This is something that I've often think about. I never thought about who wrote this. You think about some of these horror movies or these uh, thrillers or these murder movies, whatever they are. And you think, okay, okay, you're watching one and a half hours of movie, but it probably take the person months to write the book, write this, the script or the book, whichever way they're getting it from. Then it takes them months for the director and the producer and everybody to visualize it and then bring it into production. And then the editors, months again, weeks to edit it. And you think about the person who is managing all that, the road, the writer, the, you know, all that stuff, how much corruption is going on in their mind because how much, especially this horror movie, where they have to work a sequence after sequence in their mind of killing and murder and scaring people and making people go berserk and just darkness. They have to study, they have to read about, you know, the occult, they have to read about witches and you know, wizardry and all that. And all that information now is piled up in their head. And when they now go out and they talk darkness and people don't want to be around them in real life and they go and kill themselves, people say, well, what, what happened? Why, why did they do that? Because it's just a lot of, it's like a lot of impure thoughts. The thoughts have to be so impure. And in that, all that impurity, and they become a master of the genre. That's normally what they say. They become a master of impure thoughts and sickness and dark things that you think, yuck. And you hear them open them out. You're thinking, what a horrible thing to say. And you say, oh, yeah, that person, they, so they're sick. So this is where it is. But when you hear pure words, you have to think about it, that you have to go to the source. And the source is at the fountain. The brain is the fountain. The mind is the fountain. And this is where we start. So pleasant words are as a honeycomb. And you know with a honeycomb, when you just bite into it, it's just going to just burst with sweetness. So much sweetness that you think, oh, it's too sweet. <laughs> and you want to be that person. You want to be that person who when you open your mouth, it's just sweet. And it's just like, oh man, I just want more <laughs> of all that sweetness that comes out of your mouth. And the reality of life is that what makes life sometimes so sweet, just having people around you that will speak a pleasant word, that will just say something pleasant, even in the worst of time, and especially in the best of time. Um, I've had experiences where I'm at some a place, and um, it's a beautiful place, but there's somebody there that they brought their darkness with them. And the things they're saying, you just start to look around and you're thinking, I'm not in a garden anymore. I'm in the pits of hell. Because the things the person is saying is just bringing you down. But when you're in a, especially a beautiful place or a quiet place and pleasant words are being spoken, oh, doesn't it make you feel good? And this is what we want to do. We want to be able to sweeten whatever, wherever we're at. So if we're in the pits of hell, you want to sweeten that. If you're in a good place or a pleasant place or a neutral place, you can make a neutral place just be exciting because of the pleasant word and held to the bones. So much sicknesses, as you know, are linked to stress, are linked to unpleasant experiences. You know, most of what we call these modern weird disease, like the autoimmune diseases and so forth, they're all linked to Stress. Now, not necessarily that stress created the disease, but stress exacerbated the disease and made the disease become more powerful 
because the person is using up all their energy and their whatever power force of life force that they have to basically deal with the stressful situation. And a lot of times stressful situation is just created by the things people say. People can get you down because they're down and they just say, I'm down, I'm going to drag you down. Um, you know, and so you have to learn also to make that slide off your back. In Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1, 2, and 3. Hebrews 13, verse 1, 2, and 3. It says here, let brotherly love continue. So we're going to stop right there. Let brotherly love continue before we go any further. And this is what we need to do. Let brotherly love continue. It's just nice to be able to have just beautiful conversations where you could just laugh and talk and just feel good about stuff that you're not even anything to laugh and laugh and talk about. So, you know, you're just talking about stuff. You can talk about even the most terrible things and it's just great. You know, others are going berserk. But as somebody said, well, how could you have a pleasant conversation about something that's not pleasant? It's not so much the conversation, the context or the content of the conversation is pleasant. It's that the person you're talking to is pleasant. So you can just relax and you just kick back and you're talking about the questions in life, the deep questions in life, but you're not going crazy because it's not so much the, the issue is not the deep question in life is that you're having a conversation with somebody and it's pleasant because it's pleasant to talk to the person. So you could talk about something that is pleasant, you know, like honey or oranges or talk about something good that happened in life and you have a pleasant conversation or you could be talking to a person about something unpleasant and you still have a pleasant conversation. And, um, Somebody say, I don't, I don't get it. Well, just one day you'll do it and you'll say, oh, this is what he's talking about. Because it's not so much the content or the context that, you know, whatever situation you're talking about and in whatever circumstances you're in, but it's the person. Because the person, okay, you can have a pleasant conversation with the person because you have a pleasant um, interaction. And the, the thing you're talking about might be stressful, but you're not stressed talking about it. Because it's pleasant. <laughs> so hopefully you understand that. So let brotherly love continue. Uh, this is Philadelphia. This is a love that you have between brothers. Where you just like being around each other. You're used to each other. You know each other. And you have a pleasant interactions with each other. And this is what is important. Because this is the source. Often we get some of the most pleasant words. That are sweet, as, are sweet to the soul. And health to the bones. It make you want to live. You know. It, often. Um, most of the time. I say the highest percentage. 90 something percent probably. Of people are committing suicide. It's because they live a life. Where they're loveless. And they're not a darkness. The words they speak. The words that are spoken to them. The experiences they have. Is not with brotherly. Brotherly love. So because they don't have that experience. Life is miserable. And it doesn't matter how poor they are, it doesn't matter how rich they are, it doesn't matter how, how well connected they are or how not well connected they are. At the end of life, life is not at the end of the day, life is not pleasant, so you don't want to continue in life. But one of the things that make life most pleasant, our best source of happiness, is the words that we say to each other. And this is what we need to do, pleasant words. So let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful of and um, to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. So you know the stories in the Bible, so I have to go over those stories about entertaining stra um, strangers and unaware, unbeknownst to the person they were entertaining. Angels, like the story of Lot, is one of the best examples. Well, be not forgetful to entertain strangers. See, when you can just, yeah, when you can just be pleasant to a stranger, that's your test right there. Just be pleasant to somebody. You're probably never going to see them again. And most of the time, you never see a stranger again. Sometimes they're a stranger because they're living in a community, in a sense of foreigner. But sometimes it's just somebody passing through. This is more the context here. And you're just going to show love to them and be nice to them. And then, bye. And if you can show brother love like that, you're the person I want to be around. Because then it's just all about just loving somebody and that's just who you are because it's just it doesn't matter you love your brother 
but also you love the stranger. So be not forgetful to entertain strangers because you could be entertained in angels unaware. And this is so much time the story of brothers. I'm um, sorry, the story of the Bible. And so you think about even the story of Christ, that Christ sustains and is just everyday needs because he had needs as us. All of us have need food, he need a shelter, need somewhere to just have somebody to talk to. And that end up falling on Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. Those three siblings became his best place that he could go to, his place of retreat, of escape. This was the Lord of glory came down to earth, and when he came, it was just the same thing. He was a stranger. It was somebody that, you know, was in need because he didn't have, he was doing ministry and he didn't have all the financial needs and wherewithal to sustain himself and his disciples. But here he had a home. And he had a home that he could go to that were not family members. These were just people that were strangers to him. And they took him in. And often he was able to teach them some of the most intimate things of the Bible to them because they were strangers. What well, we think about one of the most important passages of Scripture in the whole Bible is the story of Christ talking to um, the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well. This was truly a stranger. This was answering the question, who is my neighbor? Well, here's our, his neighbor, somebody that was he was brought up supposed to hate because they were not from the same people group and they were not from the same religion. But yet Christ dropped on her some of the most profound um, understanding of salvation in the whole Bible. A person that technically should not have been received that should be a Jew that he taught that. So when you look at the stories in the Bible, you find very important that it's important that we, we be not forgetful to entertain strangers. I'm always interested to note that even in many countries, their failure and what caused them many times to fall into even bondage was that they were inviting to people that were foreigners and then they came in and then sacked them and destroyed them. But the Bible still encourages us that we don't know what people will do to us, but it's important for us to be kind you know, to people and even to strangers. I, I still have even practice this, that if I'm on my own, if I'm driving my car by myself, I will some sometimes pick up hitchhikers. As if I'm by myself, just in case I grab the steering and, and turn it off the road, my car off the road or something. Um, but it's just take care of people that you don't know and just practice that. But don't practice what I just said. You, you have to do that on your own. Don't do it and say, I tweeted it. But, you know, sometimes just picking up people off the street, um, and you do this, and what, what is that doing? That's just simply, you know, just make you, give you an opportunity sometime to just bless somebody that is not a brother, you don't know the person, you're never going to see this person again, and just learn to spontaneously bless people. So, um, again, it is our opportunity to bless others in important ways. And verse 3 of 13 says, Remember them that are in bonds, as bond with them, and them which suffer adversity, as being yourself also in the body. So the words pleasant are words of ministry. The most powerful part of ministry is the words we speak. You think about evil worship. Worship constitutes of offering, singing prayer, and the exhortation, the talk from the desk where the minister goes up and say pleasant words about God and about truth and encourage the members to live righteously this is the most important part even what i'm doing here this morning is the words the words is what will condemn us our words will what will condemn us and our words is what will justify us the words we speak and so we want to make sure that if we are pure as we claim and we are christ that we speak words that will not make people want to go outside and kill themselves but we speak words that will encourage people to want to live because i'm saying to you when you listen to some people, it make you want to live. You're like, oh man, that's pleasant. I want to live tomorrow to hear more of those words. You listen to some other people, they make you just want to go and jump off a cliff because the words they say is so grinding and so abrasive and it just make you feel bad and just feel terrible inside. And you don't need people to make you feel worse than how you feel about yourself. As I always say, I don't need to go to church and have a pastor tell me that I need to sin more. I can figure out that on my own. 
I don't need to have people tell me that I need to be more worthless and, and so forth. I can figure that out on my own. I need to hear words that are going to make me feel better and make me feel that I should do better and I should live, live better. So let brotherly love continue. It's okay for it to continue. Now, the Bible describes to us our experience and how we should be one with each other and how we should come into oneness. And you find this passage of scripture in John chapter 17, verse 17 through, through 23. The old passage most naturally of John, the book of John, is very important for this topic. But I'll just read it here, John chapter 17, verse 17 through 23. It says, Sanctify them through thy, thy truth, thy word is truth. And so, most actually, if we want to speak pleasant words that are sweet to the soul, they're pleasant words that are like honeycomb, that are sweet to the soul, and they're like hell to the bones, uh, truth has to be there. Because um, one would not say that a person speaking error is speaking pleasant words. It might be delusional words, and it might make the person in a deluded way think it's going to be positive and things are going to work out well. So we have to be careful because there's pleasant words, and also the flip of that could be flattering words or lying words to make you feel good, to tickle you, to make you feel, you know, of itching ears. And you know, the Bible talks about this in the last days that they will be heaping to themselves preachers with itching ears. So it's unpleasant, you know, because I have to think about that because you could t tell a person to do the right thing and the person get depressed. Have you ever seen that? You say to a person, hey, do the right thing and the person feel depressed because they want to do the wrong thing. You know, they, they have something sick they want to do and you're discouraging them from doing it. So so then it brings me to this thinking. Pleasant words. Aren't people who talk lies pleasant words? Aren't people who tell you that, hey, I want to fornicate with you, but they tell you not in those words because that's harsh. <laughs> but they tell you it in other sweeter ways. And you're like, oh, that sounds so good. I, I want to get I want to get a piece of that. So truth has to be part of the words that we speak because somebody could say, all I want to do, go around and say, play. you know, some people, they're like, um, I'm trying to find a positive way to say it, but they like to, um, you know, talk, oh, wow, uh, a, a clean way to say this, but they like to talk stuff that just, they, they're flattering you. That's, I guess, the best way to say it. They're flattering you and they like to just smooth you and talk all kind of stuff and it's just foolishness. And yet, but somebody said, but they talk very pleasant. They're always upbeat. Yeah, they're upbeat because they can you. <laughs> and they try to make you feel good over nonsense. And, you know, so pleasant words. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So in our pleasant words, we shouldn't be talking words that are just flattery. Words are not trying to get over and people try to con them, trick them, make a fool of them, deceive them. But, but we're saying it to make them feel good. And normally con men you know, confident artists, people that win your confidence and then rip you off, they talk pleasant words. So somebody could say, hey, what are you talking about here? Because people talk pleasant words all the time that are some of the most wicked, brutal people. True. So that's what we are saying now. The Bible says, sanctify them by the truth. That word is true. So Lord, don't flatter us. And this is why evildoers or people who are novices misunderstand the Bible because the Bible has things to say harsh against sin. So then somebody say, well, the Bible contradicts itself because how can God talk about pleasant word where so much of the Bible is unpleasant? If God said, don't sleep with a dog, though somebody, see, to, 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 it depends on who is listening. To a person who wants to sleep with dogs, um, they will see those words as un unpleasant. But to the Christian, it's not unpleasant. You understand what God is saying. It's not trying to you know, make you feel good. In bestiality, so if that makes sense. So the, that's just the reality. If God, if you're a thief, and God said, "Thou shalt not steal," um, you know that could depress your day. Um, so again, our pleasant words has to be in truth. We can't lie to people. Somebody can't say, "How do I look?" And you say, "Oh, girl, you look so good." You can't say that. And the person look like they're 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 in a in a in a carnival. Or they look like a clown. Um, don't do that. That's not pleasant words. You're lying. If you look at a person, a person look like they're going to audition for the next clown act. Then you don't tell them say that, but you tell them something um, realistic. Um, you know, I will get rid of all of that madness off myself and take off that wig and the, the red thing on your nose. 
Um, John 17 verse 18 says, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sake I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified th uh, through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which the, thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. So, if you notice here, pleasant words has to be mixed with truth. I'm almost finished here with this passage of scripture, but pleasant word has to be mixed with truth. You got to combine truth in there because you can't really say that a person that is a liar, but they, they normally make you feel good is making you pleasant word because it's really lying words. So truth has to be there. And so if you're speaking words that are pleasant, it doesn't mean that the Bible says, hey, please speak pleasant words. You just lie to people all the time. Speak pleasant words. You talk to people, things that made them feel good. Imagine now um, you have all these preachers out there preaching. Hey, everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be good. Life is going to be good. Things are going to work out. And all these disasters and mayhem happening. And people are just dying without pulling up, repenting. So you look at it, you say some of the most unpleasant people are the people that lie to the people week in, week out, telling people things are great, things are good, things are going to be fine. Instead of trying to tell the people that, yes, Lord will bless you, but you need to repent and live a clean life. Those to me are more pleasant words because they're honest. They're true. Verse 22 says, And the glory which thou hast gave, that gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. So love and truth can't be separated. It's just the reality of life. A person that speaks pleasant word to you, you don't want them to speak lies to you. You want to speak the truth. And the truth will make the relationship stronger because the words are pleasant and it's true. And even if you have to say words that are, I say a rebuke, a correction, the words need to be peppered or seasoned with love. And then the words will have a better effect. So you still love the person, you still say the pleasant words. Remember the Bible is very clear, especially in Proverbs and Psalms, that it's a rebuke to a person that is wise. Always work up beneficial for them. But if you rebuke somebody that is foolish and is um, has problems in their mind, they'll attack you. So you just know that and you just roll along with the process. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1, 2, and 3 as we speak about pleasant words. So you want to have pleasant words. You want to say pleasant words to people. You want to say the words to people that make them feel good. But don't eliminate truth from that. What do you say, Bridget? You say amen to that? <laughs> amen. So in Philippians chapter 2, verse 1, 2, and 3, it says here, sorry, it says here, if there be uh, therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy, fill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife and vain glory, but in loneliness of mind let each esteem the other better than themselves. <laughs> let's each some a better let each esteem each other better than themselves. Now here are some principles that I would say that are right here that will guard you in how and help you in saying words that are pleasant to people. So you're saying it because verse one here, you're trying to comfort people in love. Oftentimes the only thing you can do is say words that's comfortable. Whereas earlier I talked about this week where people are going through tragedy feeling pain. You say words of comfort. Also, the spirit that you bring to what you're saying. Remember, vocal inflections, um, body language, attitude, um, the intonation of the voice, all that is how we communicate. 
and so you communicate in a compassionate way that makes the words pleasant and pleasant words are always words that are filled with mercy because oftentimes we're talking to a person and it's just simply because we want to make their day brighter because we understand that each of us go through various different pressures very different problems and we just need a word of encouragement just a word to make us feel better just to help us through and oftentimes that's the only thing that we can do for a person because you know there's days when no you know you, you go to your day there's nothing really bothering you but it's other times when you need words of comfort words of encouragement or just a pleasant conversation where you're just having a nice conversation and you forget your troubles and i'm sure you've been there where you 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 know your days start bad or middle of the day or the end of the day is going bad and somebody starts talking to you about something on the news or something in their life and you're just having a nice conversation and for that moment for a little while you just forget your troubles and that's what a pleasant conversation can do so any bowels if any bowels and mercy Fill my joy says here be like minded having the same love the same love so you love as brethren, as it says. Let brother love continue. Being of one accord. So we, 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 we know. All right. We can see eye to eye. And so what did that do? Because you know the deal. You know what's going on. You know that there's a lot of struggles in this life. You know that the enemy, the devil goes, goes around like a roaring lion seeking him shoot. He, who he should destroy. You know that each of us having our own different problems personally, health-wise, mental, physical, spiritual. We have things that we're dealing with within our families. We have things in our jobs. We have various different pressures of life and just the disappointment sometimes that lives bring in various different ways. And so you don't need people to be pulling you down and dragging you down because you already have all that against you trying to pull you into the pit of debt and you need somebody to pull you out with some words. So being of one accord and of one mind, you understand. So if anybody should understand, it should be the brethren. Because you understand more than anybody else what my struggles are, what my pressures are. Because we all go through these pressures, but the Christian have a better insight as to what's going on. And so your task is different than, say, somebody else who, you know, that's not their issue. They're not dealing with that. Because they just they have other ways to get rid of their problems. In other words, they when they feel down and not looking for anybody to talk to, they just turn to the bottle and they just go drink some alcohol. When they feel down, they turn to drugs to lift them back up. But I'm gonna tell you, a nice conversation can do more for you than any drugs. A conversation that helps set your mind right, work out your problems, that can do more for you than any drugs, any alcohol. Because when you, drugs and alcohol, it doesn't leave you with the same problem. The problem then got solved. You didn't get have somebody to help work work through anything with you. So we want to uplift each other. And it says, let nothing be done to strive in vain glory. But in loneliness of mind, each is teaming the other better than themselves. So our aim is, how can I help you? How can I be there for you? How can I uplift you? How can I make your life better? How can I make your life feel better? And if I can do that for you, then basically I'm ministering to you and I'm uplifting you. And that's all that people need many a time. As I say, you see out of the man that's going on in our society, it's always linked to people who, sad to say, they have no pleasant words speaking to them. They have no brotherly kindness speak um, ex to experience. There's no let brotherly love continue. There's so many people living in a world where their relationships in their homes are loveless and is hopeless. They go to church, it's loveless and hopeless, and they go into society, it's loveless and hopeless. And they need just some pleasant words spoken to them. And that's what I believe in, just the sweet experience of having a brother with you to bless you. An experience of this is talked about in um, Psalms 133, verse one through three Psalms 133 verse 1 through 2 and 3 and here it speaks of the story this is a story of the anointing of um, Aaron and these are literally two brothers that were separated from for, from each other for 40 years they went through the experience of um, the exodus and um, they're gonna go through experience which is not pleasant words per se 
but it's a pleasant experience. And this experience I'll um, apply it to words spoken and just the sweet experience of having somebody sweet around you. A song of degree, this is Psalms 133 verse 1, a song of degree of David. Behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. So this is true. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirt of his garments. As the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descend upon the, mount, the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life evermore. For there. Um, that pleasant experience is described similar to what happened to Aaron and Moses. Uh, Aaron and Moses uh, worked together in the ministry. And when it was time to anoint Aaron, uh, Moses brought out the anointing oil and Moses poured the oil. Not just, you know, normally you see an anointment, they put a little dab, two dabs across the forehead. Here the oil was poured because it was a symbol of how much the Spirit needed to be upon Aaron. And it ran down to his beard and it went down to his skirt of his garment and it just filled him. And this, it was indicative of what a pleasant experience it is when brethren dwell together in unity it is like oil pouring all over your body because it feels so good and this is what people needed uh, the world in its coldness and its materialistic way we all need material possession but christ says we should not set our hearts on material possession this is not the aim of life the aim of life is to have each other and your god and so when you have this experience where you can have an experience where just dwelling with somebody, having a good friend, and the experience is like oil being poured upon Aaron, and it just ran down his beard, and it's just like, it's just so good. Aaron was like, oh no, you're soiling my clothes. You're like, praise the Lord, this is good. This is what is, is need to be. And this is these two brothers that are just dwelling together in unity. This was the force and the strength of always God's church. And it's a force and strength of life. When you have people that in the home life, you have somebody that can not only speak pleasant words, but you can love and you can be a blessing and they can bless you. You have a sweet experience that makes you just feel good. You just want to run around and just scream. And then you have that experience in the church and in the society. You have people that you can just see and just you just want to hug and just have a good conversation. That's what makes life happy. But we don't have this. Often a person say, you know what happened? What's the point? What's the point? Because this life is just bitter. You can see the bitterness stamped on people's face because they have so much bitter experience. And I've learned over the years, whatever I'm doing, that I try to sidestep sinners as much as possible to not have these type of unpleasant experience. Because when you have that constant annoyance, you know, it's like a mosquito. If you have a mosquito trying to suck you of blood, and they, they normally, it gets terrible when they come near your ears because they, they have this pitch, high pitch sound. And, you know, not only is it irritating to the ears because uh, they're cretins, but it's also, you know what they're coming to do. Oh, man, they're going to suck me a blood and then leave me with a scar or something or probably give me some virus so you, you, that sound is even not only it's disturbing because you know that this thing could give you a disease and then it's annoying all of a sudden it's going to bite and suck the life out of you. So when you've learned some of the principles that we have talked about and we'll talk about going forward as we keep working through Proverbs, you see how important it is not to have this type of element around you, this unpleasant element. And then like mosquitoes or flies. Because it's just this constant buzzing in your ears, unpleasant words that is just bitterness to the soul and, and basically death to the bone marrow. Um, you can't produce good blood because even down to your bone it's painful. Um, and it's like killing a mosquito. When the mosquito is dead, you feel more comfortable uh, or you feel uncomfortable. You see a lot of blood on your hands. But it's important for you to learn 
to be that person that say pleasant words, that put yourself in other people's position and put yourself in other people's position and listen to yourself and say, wow, if I'm talking like that, if I have to listen to myself, I'll depress myself and then have some mercy on others and say, oh my word, I need to help them, help them out. And just go right in the head and just say pleasant words because you have to put yourself into the personal position that if somebody said what you said to them, if somebody said what you said to another person, if somebody said that to you, would that make you depressed? And then the moment you say, yes, that would be very depressing for somebody to say that to me. Then you say, then you, 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 you follow what I'm going to say next. Knock it off. Stop it. Don't do it. Learn to speak words that not going to make people want to kill themselves or feel depressed or feel hated or feel that they never got loved and they never had a pleasant day. Learn those things. Practice it. Learn to put yourself in other people's shoe or, or you know, put yourself in a situation where you're talking to yourself because there's many times the way people talk to others, they couldn't take it if somebody talked to them exactly the same. And the words that they say they couldn't take it if somebody say those exact words. So what's important here? To let brotherly love continue. Speak the words that's going to give life to somebody. Practice calling people and just saying a word that's going to uplift them, let them feel better, make their day lighter. Say words that are going to be true, that if they follow what you're saying, true words of true instructions, true advice, if they follow what you're saying, their life is going to be better, their life is going to be pleasant, their life is going to be, live, be successful. There's people that they say very flattering words, but if you follow what they're saying, you'll be a failure just like them. You'll have a miserable life just like them. You won't be that person. So, it's pleasant to live to bed together in unity. It's pleasant to be able to have, you know, that those words those words, um, those words that are spoken, that when it's spoken, it's their uplifting words. You share those words with somebody. You give somebody a good greeting, a good um, hug, uh, say something nice to them. Because sometimes you're going to be the only person that's going to make that person feel good about anything. You're probably going to be the only real positive interaction. Because, you know, this most interaction that people go through the day is just interaction. They're not good or bad. You go to the store, you go somewhere, go somewhere. People say, hi, thank you, thanks for the, your, your, your business, and you go. You don't really do anything for your life. But when somebody says something that's heartfelt and deep in meaning for you and it blesses you, not just, hey, you need to love Jesus and you need to know Jesus, but just bless you with something pleasant. Oh, that lifts you up and that makes life really what it is. And that's what we need. It is, you know, as I say, I belabor this point because I see the sad part about our culture. Our culture is very cold, you know, our culture is a very cold culture. And because of this, there's so many people that are depressed and they're trying to be happier or get happiness through drugs, alcohol, through various different weird activities, through video games, movies. Um, they're trying to get their happiness and source of happiness through all these different things that's not working, right? So what it is is that the main source of happiness is our connection with God and our connection with each other. But most people, they have such bad experience with their fellow human beings because they've been abused, they've been lied, conned, treated terrible, that they just go into a shell and they stay by themselves. And this has become the general societal problem but this leads to a lot of suicidal people there's a lot of depressed people it's a lot of maniacs in our society so i encourage you um don't go along with the culture because this part of the culture is very dangerous and it's very depressing um be that different person be that person who bless somebody be that person who say pleasant words to people that are going to be sweet to the soul and it's going to be held to the um held to the um to the the bone marrow be that different person but uh, the problem is is that you have too much negativity in our society too much people that never experience love and never give love you don't want to be that person you want to be that person that 
experience it and you want to be the person that give it and i believe that's what's really missing people take think oh what we need is more mental health drugs more drugs to make people feel better what we need is more comedy more movies more video games more this that's not what people need what people need is more not more they need a relationship most people never ever had one and that's what is missing in our society in acts chapter 2 verse 40 through 42 acts chapter 2 verse 42 42 40 through 42 it says and with many other words did he testify exhorting saying save yourself from this untoward generation so this has always been the message of the bible save yourself from this untoward generation is nothing new um every generation god has men and women who rise up to the occasion to deal with the sins of the nation and of the church and as i mentioned here one of the biggest problems we're having is people who are depressed this is why we're having a drug epidemic is pain and depression mental and physical pain we have a problem with so many mass murders is because people you know are just depressed and this is why many depressed people go and go kill people who are happy you go shoot up a church shoot up a school a theater a concert just you know depressed people killing people are happy or who seem happy because many people are in those places they're depressed too because it's just a general problem in our society we have a very loveless cold um society you go to the church it's loveless and cold but our aim is to preach to encourage you that at least in what you can affect in your home in your church when people come around you even if they're strangers you give them pleasant words not flattering words not just telling them how oh, i like that scarf or i like that hat i mean words that's going to really uplift them and make them feel better about life and you'll find that sometimes that's the only blessing the person got all day long not just say i bless you but i'm saying something that's going to make the person feel a bit better some words of encouragement um and then it says in verse 41 then they that glad to receive um, his words were baptized and the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls and they content continue steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers so here is a new experience of the christian the christian is supposed to have a new pleasant blessed experience the christian is supposed to be partaking of doctrines that means our true teachings from the bible too many people there's interactions what make the word so unpleasant because they speak so much falsehood falsehood never mean you know never you know end in pleasant words it's just it is just the nature of the beast also fellowship you fellowship with other like aaron and moses we have deep interaction that just make you feel good about life and sometimes you can't explain it because it's not something to intellectual explain it's something that you have to experience physically and emotionally where you just have a good time with a person and words weren't even exchanged it's just sweet to the soul and health to the bones and so with Aaron just pouring that water that oil down and it's just running down it's just you just want to hug and love that person so just good fellowship it's good interaction we're breaking the bread so they're eating together and they're praying together this is what we need and when we get this, this is a true heaven. This is a heaven on earth. This is what we need. The isolation creates the problem. Notice the moment man sinned, he hid from God. When God calls Adam and call him to repentance and confession, he had to present himself. We want to be able to face our brother. We don't want to be like the general custom in the culture that we live in, where people could just look at you and not even say hi. Just cold and just by themselves even though i use this these various different means of technological communication i still understand that the primary thing is i have to talk to my brethren i have to interact with them fellowship with them pray with them sing with them um you know just have that good experience with them else you know then we're just part of that coldness so i encourage you you know reach out reach out to myself reach out to somebody today and receive the blessing of communication and interaction it is for you this is what god created us we are social creatures we are not created to live in isolation let us pray we thank the lord again for your love towards us and the blessings of knowing indeed the only true god we pray father that you may be with us as we go through us of this day we thank you dear lord for your love that you give to us and the love that you've 
place in our hearts to love each other. I pray, dear Lord, that we might love each other and remove by thy grace and esper the, the evil, the darkness out of our talk, and we learn to talk things that will uplift each other. Bless each and every one of us that is here. And may you be with us as we go through us of this day. For Christ's sake, amen. Well, thanks again for being with me on Revive Reform Radio. Looking forward to talking to you tomorrow, uh, Monday morning, when we're going to talk about motivation. Until then, I pray that you may continue to walk with the King. Mm -hmm.